Thank you. Bye-bye. Hello, I'm uh, John Day. I uh, travel all the way here from uh, Seattle, Washington. I think uh, counts for inviting me. And uh, I just had to add that to my slide, the partly cloudy, oops, I'm on my graphics just in here. That's the best thing. Um, the work we're doing in Seattle right now, we're referring to as partly cloudy, uh, so the clouds are different, the, the weather in Seattle is always partly cloudy. We're also a pure bioinformatics shop, so no MPI. Uh, we have a big Linux cluster. We really don't worry too much about tightly coupled things. If uh, the user comes to me with an MPI problem, I usually rewrite the code a little bit. Um, it's just something I'm not, not interested. Uh, one of the best funded uh, cancer research uh, facilities in, in the U.S. Uh, we do quite well on that. Uh, we have a lot of staff. Uh, we have a beautiful uh, campus also. Oh, there we go. Partly cloudy. Um, so in our neighborhood, uh, Google is uh, just across the street. Uh, Amazon occupies a uh, major part of Seattle, just a few blocks away from us. And it's not on the map, but on the east side is Microsoft. So we're really surrounded by, by high tech and cloud people who come to us wanting us to test things for them. Um, we have a very small group, SciComp that I'm part of. Uh, our HPC resources are not really in, overly impressive, but we're Ubuntu based, we run Swarm, we run Easy Build with Elmod. Um, and we own, you know, NetApps, IceMons, BGFS. Uh, I'm sure there's some other storage things that we have in there also. So, right around when I started three years ago, we had a new IT management at the Hutch, and their motto was cloud first. So, there is no debate or why did we choose something. It just came down from management. So, any new project that came to us, we thought, well, how can we make it run in a cloud infrastructure? So we had quite a few initiatives uh, starting a few years ago. Uh, the first thing, since we have a cluster, like what can we do to just move it into EC2? Um, Microsoft came to us, they actually came up with a, an Azure. They actually implemented R in their Azure cluster, and I'll show you a slide on that. Uh, of course, AWS Batch came out a few years ago. Uh, Globus Genomics, uh, that, that project never quite got off the ground. I think we're still trying to work on that. And what's not on here is we've actually got a small cluster running in Google right now. Uh, just cover this really quick. Uh, for those of you who are in Azure or you're using AD, uh, this is really cool for a researcher. If you have R locally installed on your laptop, you can just go anywhere in the US and just attach the Azure cloud. Um, you just do this library call, do Azure Parallel. Uh, there's just a little bit to know about the same sort of thing like the do parallel loop structure. Uh, you keep your credentials in a local file. You can also have a, your cluster.json. You can define a cluster, how many nodes you like. Uh, you know, yeah. Microsoft will spool up a small cluster for you, uh, 10, well, I asked for a few hundred nodes, which they were kind of surprised, but uh, we never got that to work. On a scale of around 10 nodes, it works. And um, you have like a little mini cluster, and at the end of your, uh, your session, you can stop the cluster and it goes away. So, uh, you know, you can do this on Wi Fi, it doesn't really matter. It helps to have small payloads. Uh, you can stage data ahead of time in the Azure Cloud. So you don't have to move it from your laptop through a, a horrible Wi-Fi connection in a coffee shop. You could have your, your data pre-staged. Uh, um, but I will say though that this, this is a disaster and I haven't got any, any customers to adapt it. Um, you know, the type of thing that would interest us would be like hundreds of nodes and we've never been able to scale at that level. Um, I'm still working with the guys at Microsoft. It's still, and this is open source too, you can find this. Uh, it's actually published out on the internet. Uh, and this was a slide to demonstrate that our cluster is it's running around 90% of the time. So very, very high utilization. How can we expand the usage? We normally get some funding every year to expand it. 2017, we decided not to uh, and use Amazon instead. 
So, uh, this is a little bit out of order, but uh, I'll get back to this later. This is a really confusing slide, but uh, on the bottom, Rhino is the name of our cluster, Gizmo is the name of our cluster, and again, we have BGFS for Scratch, we have NetApp for uh, Slash App is where we have all of our software, all of our easy build. It's not a very big uh, amount of data. And the ice lawn is where we have petabytes of data. We also have our, our own Swift stack for object store, which is mostly uh, archiving. And then in Amazon, we built a cluster called Beagle. And uh, internally also we use uh, Chef for deployment. So we were literally able to just use Chef, go into Amazon, uh, provision nodes, EC2 instances that mirrored our exact infrastructure internally. So uh, everything that you used to, the right down the operating system, all the libraries. Um, the storage is a little bit more complicated. Uh, we're also using Slurm, but we were using version 17, so like you're saying, uh, the cloud native version 18, it's not, and we're not even upgraded yet. So how we did this is we actually, uh, there was a hook inside Slurm for power management. So if you want to power down your cluster and save electricity, and when the Slurm sees like new jobs arrive in the queue, it'll literally power on the nodes. So that little hook, and the power on thing is just an open. You can write whatever code you want. So we wrote our own code to turn provision <coughs> into EC2. So that's how we're doing it now. And I think the new power, I think the new setup that you're going to see in 1808, it might actually have some of our code in there. I think it's just it's the same idea. You know, you've got jobs sitting in a queue. Uh, you want to spool up some resources so you can just power those on. And of course, the minute the jobs are, are finished, we want to power those down so we're not paying for those easy two instances. Um, way at the end of my deck, uh, we're trying to come up with a new backup scheme for the petabytes of data on the ice lawn. And we're using something called Objective SS, Objective FS. And that is syncing everything into Amazon. And we've gotten rid of our tape infrastructure on site. So what the users have in Amazon is a read-only copy of all of their local storage. Um, and in trying to move into the cloud, we're also encouraging people. So they can't write back into here. Uh, it's, it's really awkward. It's slow. Um, so you have a read-only read copy of your data. And if you're going to produce new data, we're trying to encourage people to use S3 and natively write into the cloud. Or you know, sometimes your result data in bioinformatics can be very small, but your intermediate results can be in the terabytes. So every use case is you know, a lot of hand holdings that will try to get <coughs> people into the cloud. Um, app is pretty straightforward. It's, it's uh, you know, every version of R and Python and Bowtie and all of our tools. So it's only like maybe 100 gigs. So we're using that. Uh, is like an NFS, which is like the, the most expensive storage you can use in, in AWS, but we can't think of a better way to do that yet. Um, so uh, it's a very busy slide, I don't know. a lot to see here, but, uh, and we've also duplicated all of that, it's called Koshu internally, we should get rid of it, in the, in the Google Cloud Platform. And I don't know anything about that, really. I can't speak too much about that. I wasn't uh, involved in that. But basically, the same sort of model, uh, duplicating our, our node infrastructure, duplicating our storage, coming up with a way for researchers to write results or copy it back in. So um, this was our first step. We know a lot about clusters. We know a lot about scripting. Um, and we just made a mirror copy of our internal cluster in the cloud. And this is probably like a really good poster for, for what not to do in cloud computing. Um, it's crazy expensive. Uh, it's slower than what's on-prem. The storage is awkward. Um, so probably going backwards, you know, what we, what would really work better are things that are actually cloud native. So architectures in the cloud that, that work really well in the cloud. So the bare metal, the local you know, storage, things that are fast, our network, it's really hard to get similar services like that in, in Amazon. 
So we really have to take every new user and kind of look at their use case and just try to figure out like what's the best way to move that in there. And just philosophically, when I think about building clusters, you know, they're just kind of the kitchen sink of everything. They have every every version of software. They're very rich. They have huge amounts of memory, lots of resources, and typically you just build these things and put them out there. Uh, but when you do something that's purely cloud native, you really have to be very precise. You just implement the exact service that that customer needs. So instead of having the last four versions of Bowtie in your cluster, you have a container with only Bowtie, and it just has a pipe in and a pipe out. So very different philosophically, and it takes, you know, and the effort to move into the cloud at that level is now we're not so much system administrators as software engineers. So we look a lot more like uh, software providers than like just service providers. Like I built this big cluster; it's in the building down the down the street, and you know here's the slur manual how to use it. Uh, when we put people into the cloud, it's it's a lot of handle. So of course, just kind of comparing over here what I said like. Success is there's just there was nothing for our users to learn. If they're using S batch now, it, it still works. You just specify the name of the remote cluster. The storage is, is not as good. <coughs> it's consistent. Every piece of software we have internally is is also what we have in the cloud. And you know, I don't know why that's opportunities, but we're just perpetuating, you know, existing workflow stuff. And again, like, you know, using layer two through a Firewall, um, yeah, so there's just a lot of things to work on there. Some things that we could be taking advantage of would be like spot market, and people would be like, well, why am I going all this extra effort? I want to be able to use the cloud because, you know, you promised I could use as many nodes as I want whenever I want to, and then you're telling me, like, be patient and just launch it, maybe I have to wait a couple of days. But that would really, really reduce costs. But it's sort of like the opposite of what a customer would expect. You know, if you just wait using the Amazon spot spot market, you can do computing for for uh, much more efficiency. Well, a lot of fun. Um, so, just looking at scientific pipelines that we have, we've, we again we probably have one of everything somewhere on campus. Uh, you know, every time something new comes out, uh, somebody tries it. So again, like moving all that in the cloud. So we're we're betting right now on CWL, which is, um, gosh, right, Cromwell. And that's still uh, not quite perfect in Amazon yet, but we're, we're working with Amazon to improve that. Um, so again, we think about like these services, like uh, natively we have NFS, we have really good uh, fast storage locally, but when you go into cloud, uh, you know, you end up with S3, so bucket-based object storage. Uh, SAM tools is the only bioinformatics tool I know of that can read and write natively to S3. So, you know, how do we get adoption in the industry to people start using uh, object-based storage instead of file-based? And then, people don't think about it, but there's all these key value stores in the internet that are infinitely scalable. So maybe you don't even need to store files in a traditional sense. So like really getting into how a user is using data. Maybe you could just look like a key value store, like a bunch of JSON documents or something similar, or what we see with Elasticsearch, and just use that as your storage and not use files at all. And then uh, Lambda, of course, is, is a very cool service. Uh, all the young kids, everything's an endpoint. Everything is a web service. It's just a port number and an IP, and it does something. So, uh, very good way to initiate workflows. And uh, under the covers, the Cromwell is really just you know just sitting on top of, of Lambda and Batch, of course. And these are you know we're never going to be able to do bioinformatics workflows with Lambda. It's it's the type of thing that you. You know, you want to run for seconds, and I think your build in increments of 100 millions for, for using them. And then uh, containers. So uh, AWS Batch is basically a container service. Um, 
And uh, what we do find is we go out to uh, Docker Hub, you can find almost every bioinformatics tool pre-built in the container. So all that hard work I've done on easy build, I just go out and pluck it off the internet. It's like a bow tie in it, or it's just there, we just use it. We don't even think about it. It's, you know, usually we have to do, again, like uh, some kind of shell scripting around it, like how do we get storage out of S3 into uh, a piece of uh, old bioinformatics software that can only read and write from files. So trying to connect these pipelines with shell is still really ugly. Um, but uh, we're, we're trying. So one small success, again, we've, we've, we've got like dozens of projects. I'm just trying to make this short, just kind of like an overview of a few things that we've done. Um, we do have one project that, that went really well. Uh, just trying to do uh, de novo uh, sequence assembly. Um, the data that the researcher is producing is pretty small. I think that's six gigabytes, a big number. I think that's maybe for, you know, typically we run through the sequencer, it might be uh, maybe 100, maybe three, 400 samples, and maybe the whole run from the sequencer might be six gigs. So uh, on site with our sequencing, we're, we're doing very small amounts of data. But uh, to do the alignment, we're grabbing stuff from the NCBI, the National Center for Bioinformatics, which is on the east coast of America, and we're as far away from there as you can get in Seattle. And uh, we just started out thinking, oh, we'll just go get this data and download it. We do it all the time. Uh, this data for the alignment is in the terabytes. So dragging that through the internet and storing it locally proved to be Intractable. Like we, it, you know, we were running our thing for a week at a time. It was failing, and we couldn't even get this project off the ground. We were just stuck. Uh, I was very frustrated because we have a 10 gigabit pipe to the internet. Uh, we think we're really good at that. We have a lot of scratch storage. We have, uh, you know, hundreds of terabytes. So just on a whim, we we moved it into S3, and we, we got everything done in like two or three days. It was really amazing. Um, so our data was very small. So you know, what happens, the green, uh, that's our touch green, is uh, out of our limbs, uh, management, uh, a batch of uh, sequence data will come, and we'll just move that into S3. Uh, and again, this, there's a lot of little missing parts in here. There's a lot of glue. Um, but we start an AWS batch job. And I don't understand the biology, but there's something about, because uh, they're sequencing thousands of different types of microbes, and so they can do some sort of selection about what databases they need. So there's some logic where we check to see if we have the databases we need. If we don't, we'll get them. And we'll let them sit in AWS for up to, uh, uh, well, initially infinitely. That proved costly. But I think we're aging those out at like 30 days. So maybe we might have it in cash, maybe not. So we'll go get it. And then, uh, you know, we're using uh, SAM tools, I think. We're just extracting the FASTQ out of that. I don't understand all the biology, but eventually we do the de novo uh, alignment. And the final results, again, I think this is in the gigabytes. So bringing this back is not a big deal. Uh, what's happening internally, like these intermediate results, are in the tens of terabytes. And that's all data that we're just, it's just temporary, we're just going to throw it away. So having that sort of volatility uh, within our own storage structures, is, it's difficult to schedule and provision and buy uh, stuff just grows and, and shrinks down. But, you know, when you're using Amazon, you don't care. You know, you just hit the delete button and it goes away. Um, so, so this was, was kind of a success, and of course the compute for this is really nominal. Um, also, when we're copying stuff from the NCBI, uh, Amazon doesn't charge us transport fees. Um, there's, a, there's some forms you can fill out, and Amazon, in, in an effort to get people to use their compute resources, is very interested in having uh, major data sets available. And Bill, if you have a good case for this, that there's multiple institutions that need data, especially from the NCBI, they'll store it for free. Um, this case, we're not able to do that. Uh, we had to have special permission to access this particular database. I'm not sure why you have to register to use it. Uh, it's access controlled. Uh, we get special like uh, 
short-term passwords that, that work to get the data. We have to keep it encrypted at Amazon. But uh, there are lots of cases, though, if, if you have a, things like the UCSC browser data, things like that, you can probably find it in Amazon. It's just laying around, it's there, and someone will give you a pointer to it. So this, this is, we actually did something cloud-based, and again, this was a lot of work. The researcher was very patient. It was something that we weren't experts on. Uh, you know, I work, I myself was a, a, a refugee from the dot-com in, in 2000. My office mate is an ex-Amazon employee. <laughs> so, you know, culturally in, in Seattle, it's, it's uh, we, we look more like web guys than, than scientists. So, uh, you know, we're able to get stuff like this up and running. So uh, success for this is like we can scale that. And just something else about this too. Uh, you know, if this is like a, a, a hundred runs or three hundred runs, we'll actually put that in there. So we'll 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 run you know three hundred batch jobs or a hundred. We'll make it the exact width of this. So, and this is like event driven. So as, as soon as this comes out of the instrument, we put this whole workflow through here because sometimes if there's an issue with the instrument, you want to know immediately if you can rerun or salvage the experiment or something like that. So uh, instead of just throwing it in our local queue and waiting uh, some indeterminate amount of time, you know, we are able to run this immediately for them. And we'll just make it as wide as we need. And again, it's not that, that hard. I don't think any of this stuff runs for more than uh, 20 or 30 minutes at a time. So it's still really difficult to do. Uh, again, that was one workflow. It's handmade, all the parts in there are purpose made just for that. It's all cloud native. Um, so, you know, that works really well. But again, it's really hard to, to just apply that to everything. We really have to just look at things uh, as they come up. But we're really convinced that batch is the way to go. Um, again, complex workflows. Uh, CWL is, is probably, we're starting to invest most of our effort in that, and the next time someone comes with us uh, with a project, we'll use that. Um, so, again, you know, we have, I actually deleted a few things, but it seems like we just have like a collection of almost everything uh, made. And we're big fans of Objective FS, although some, some folks have mentioned some other products that they're using the mirror. Uh, internal storage, which to look at that when we get home. Um, so we took uh, literally a couple petabytes of storage, but we used rsync. It was not a very sophisticated tool. And uh, we just pushed it all into Amazon with Objective F FS. And it's not, uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's a good product. It, it presents the storage back to you in the cloud as a native file system, but it's actually using object base underneath, which is what we would want. Uh, we're able to attach metadata to that. Of course, there's no two-way uh, replication, so it's a read-only copy of what we have. And um, the math seems fuzzy to me, but uh, management says it's it's the same cost as uh, tape. When you take into account things like staff, the maintenance on the library, you know, it was a full time FTE that just did that. Plus off site storage, uh, we we had a secured facility. The truck would come visit every other day with metal boxes, and I don't know if any of you had to do that before, like beginning career drudgery to take backups in the middle of the night. No, it's. Uh, if, 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 you, if you, it's, I don't know, I've had to do that personally when I was a young kid, and uh, to this day I hate tape. Um, <clears throat> so it, it seems to work. Um, you know, you just, a little bit of monitoring, make sure uh, everything is running every day. Um, retention periods, like the concept of that doesn't really exist anymore. Um, it's just whatever you have on site is off site. So I'm not sure if we're dealing with things like the researcher says, oh, I deleted a file by accident, can you bring it back? Uh, 
I, um, I know we have a plan for that. It's not like this. And uh, we have tons and tons of stuff on GitHub. We have chef recipes. We have container recipes. We, it's, it would take a day to go through all of our public repos. So we try to do everything like that, even our workflow for how we build machines. So um, all of our chef recipes are in GitHub. And we have a whole event-driven infrastructure on top of that. So if you check in a new recipe for a machine, it actually triggers a test instance. It gets built, deployed. Uh, if that works and passes the test, it actually just goes into production. It just happens all automatically. So uh, just a very small admin staff, if you feel there's a, a library missing or something that needs to go in FS tab that got left off, you know, edit the recipe, check it in with GitHub, uh, it'll start this whole workflow, and it just gets deployed out across the cluster and actually into Amazon on our Debo cluster also, if you set the right bits in. Um, and, you know, I've heard all these different things today. We do have a elastic search running in Amazon. That's something you can just pick off the menu now. It's just kind of amazing if you've ever had to deploy that on site. It's not, not easy. It's really cool when you can just do it by clicking a button. Um, we have uh, electron microscopes. We have uh, that whole workflow for doing protein isolation. Again, it was really difficult. I think we're using like one of those twenty-five dollar node, twenty-five dollar an hour nodes at Amazon with Nvidia chips to do the uh, reconstruction of the, the image analysis. So uh, we've got lots of little stuff like that up in mind. So. <laughs> That's just a just a quick rundown of a few things we've we've tried. Questions? So, two yeah. questions: Is economic wise, does it is it does it worth it to run on the cloud all this kind of stuff? No. It'll be, okay. Probably, probably what we spent in six months, we could have bought. You know, we could have doubled the size of our cluster, and that's something that we would run for five years typically. So we are this year. We are spending money, and we are building our cluster. Okay. Second, yeah. Second question is about your R sync. You do parallel to do R sync. Have you thought about using Globus for instance? Uh, parallel copy. No, I mean, Globus, for instance, like some, some other service that is rather than R-Sync? Because you can do parallel copy with Globus, for instance. Hmm. Uh, I don't know, I don't, yeah, it's not, not my gig to do that, so. Uh, yeah. And, I, you know, we do have a cluster, you know, I think our R-Sync is kind of, we might have come up with a, a distributed way of doing that, it's just using our own cluster. Like every every PI has their own folder, so there's like 240 folders. So I think that's a, a division of storage where you're able to just kind of uh, launch out their own cluster and let our sync do uh, like small chunks at a time. But, yeah. Okay. Other question? I have a question. Has it helped at all that Amazon is right across the street? Uh, <laughs> You know, I'm not in a really high-level uh, negotiation. I, I think our management feels that uh, if, if we show that they we're a serious player, that they might be willing to start donating. I think some of the money we're talking about is in the millions of dollars. Um, Jeff Bezos wants to help us out. But it doesn't really want to be that charitable guys. Well, he would... I think it makes them mad. People build their own data centers, so it's like, don't use mine. You know, I don't. You know. Uh, the guy who is in charge for bioinformatics globally at Amazon is a, a friend of mine. He's a, somebody I work with uh, at Biotech starting out. So, it, you know, I, I can have lunch with him maybe once a year. It's a really busy guy. But uh, that, that, that hasn't helped at all, no. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you, John.